All right. Hello, everyone. Dr. Eric, the fitness physician here with another awesome episode of the Relentless Vitality podcast. And I have an awesome guest today I'm excited to talk to you about and introduce. Her name is Leslie Kenny, and she's out in Southern California. She's a entrepreneur. She's got an extensive background at Berkeley, Harvard Business School graduate, and she has her own personal health journey, journey, which I'll let her talk about, but got involved with the Institute for Integrative uh, Nutrition and was a bulletproof coach under Dave Asprey. And, and she has basically expanded and done all kinds of cool stuff over in Europe and England. And she's currently in, in Oxford, England now, and has her own entrepreneurial venture with a company called Primating, which is involved with the production of a compound called Spermidine, which I've talked about before briefly on videos. And let her dive into that. And it's a, it's a very cool product, has a very versatile, and we're going to talk a little bit about all the benefits. And of course, we're going to talk as with everything I always talk about longevity and anti-aging and how this product and what her company is doing ties into all that. So Leslie, welcome to the show. Hello, Eric. Thank you so much for, for inviting me on. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I'm excited to have you. Um, uh, I, I heard you on another podcast and I haven't done a ton of videos on spermidine. I mean, I've, I've I've been aware of it for some time and been um, uh, in some of my uh, my own educational deep dives and conferences that I've been to and things, but I've never really done a really deep dive video presentations on. So I figured this would be a good jumping off point for any future videos. I do have someone like yourself on there as well. So yeah, if you don't mind, just uh, if you want to talk a little bit about how you uh, if, feel free to take make it as short as long as you want in terms of talking about your your own health and your your integrative background and how you got involved in researching this cool little uh, product with the, the funny name. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, long story short, I had my own, my own health challenge challenges, plural, and they, uh, they involve three autoimmune conditions, one of which I was told was incurable and got the message from my doctor that I had five years left to live. I've also had my fertility challenges. I don't think any woman ever likes to have a doctor, especially not a male doctor, <laughs> sorry to say that, say uh, sure. you're, you're infertile and we don't know why. Right. Um, uh, so I, having had these various health challenges uh, and then finding a way to turn those around myself, essentially by tapping into the body's own wisdom to heal, helping it get to a place where it had enough resources to make things work again, both on the fertility front, but also on the immune system front. So all autoimmune conditions um, like cancer and like inability to fight illnesses like pneumonia or COVID, these are immune system failures. And uh, in the case of cancer, it's an ability to surveil properly and identify cancer and get rid of it. In the case of uh, autoimmune conditions, it's inability of the body to properly identify self from non-self tissue. And obviously with, uh, with viruses, it's the body's inability to properly identify those pathogens and dispose of them. So having face these challenges and come at the other end. Um, I had, of course, my own epiphany where I realized, gee, the body is actually capable of so much more than we give it credit for. Why do we outsource our health? Um, why don't we collaborate with our brilliant doctors and work in partnership with them? using the latest breakthrough technologies, whether those are things like you use, like peptides, or whether they're things like I'm interested in, like polyamines, spermidine, spermine, why don't we use these things together and allow the body to holistically heal so that all the organs come back into balance? Not just, you know, looking at one particular organ system and identifying that, but sometimes finding that the solution to that, the drug, actually has other side effects, which again, need more drugs to deal with. So um, if I fast forward from those health challenges, which all sort of came to a head around 2004 when I was living in Boulder, Colorado, I, uh, I then found myself living in Oxford, England, where I am now. And I had 
two little kids who were at school. And as you do on the school playground, I got to talking to the other parents and uh, Americans, unlike the Brits, were not reserved. Certainly Californians are not. And I uh, wanted to know what people were doing, what they were working on. And they were working on so many fascinating subjects, everything from transcranial stimulation to cures for type 1 diabetes, all of these things. And I said, wow, that's amazing. Uh, where can my friends get a hold of your intervention? And they all said, oh, no, 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 no. We, we don't want to. We're not commercializing this. We're just we're just researching and publishing. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's a bit of a tragedy as a patient. I'd like to be able to get a hold of this. And so I then began fundraising for some of these companies. Again, uh, the Brits are very reserved, don't like to ask for money. Americans were a lot better at that. And so I began to began to work with them, uh, only was looking at regenerative health companies. I had no interest in, you know, in sort of the older stuff. I really wanted to look at the breakthrough technologies, everything from stem cells to circadian rhythm balance. Uh, to ketones. And it was during that time that I was introduced to two researchers at the University of Oxford in the rheumatoid um, arthritis department. So the Kennedy School of Rheumatology, <clears throat> the professor of immunology was Katja Simon and her researcher, her PI, what principal investigator was uh, Dr. Gada Al Saleh, and they were looking at this horribly named molecule, spermidine, and how it seemed to allow mice, elderly mice, um, rejuvenate their immune systems. Now, rejuvenate is a pretty strong word. It's not my word. It's the word that they used in a uh, in a paper that was peer reviewed and published in eLife, and. They, you know, have also done this with elderly human cells where they looked at spermidine's ability to do the same thing, but in a Petri dish. And they have subsequently done a clinical trial, the results of which will be published uh, within the year. And this essentially was allowing the immune system to come back into balance again. And philosophically, as a patient, I really like the idea of my body being in perfect balance. We often talk about optimizing, right? Optimizing the body. So what does that mean? You know, growing bigger muscles, stronger, faster, better. Well, for me, uh, yeah, all those things could be great, but I'm very happy just being in perfect balance. And when my body is in balance, I know that it can do all the tasks it needs to do that it innately knows how to do, like repair a cut. Mm -hmm. I don't have to tell it. I don't have to go to you to say, whoa, I've got a cut. What do I do? Right. Especially when I'm young, my body knows what to do. And we have that faith, especially with young people. Oh, the body will figure it out. But as we seem to get older, we, we lose that faith in our body's wisdom. So by putting it back to the center point, which is what polyamines appear to do, uh, especially with immune health, <clears throat> it, it looks like we can then help bring other things into balance. So one of the other, um, one of the other superpowers of polyamines in particular of spermidine is its ability to activate a cellular process called autophagy. That means in Greek self-eating, and it's, it's basically like your self-cleaning oven. Right? right. Or like having, you know, the Roomba go around and clean everything for you. It's so, so great. I don't have to do any vacuuming. Right. <laughs> you know, the Roomba's done it for me. Well, this is kind of like the Roomba for yourselves. Um, or, you know, sometimes they say it's like Marie Kondo in there, decluttering mm -hmm. and getting rid of the old junk and only leaving the things that spark joy in your cell. That resonates with me. So this yeah. is kind of my philosophy as a patient. I love that. That's very well summarized. And I agree 100% with you. And I love the part you said about um, balance and about kind of facilitating your body's own um, ability to do all these things, right? And that's one of, the, one of the things I always talk to my patients about is just, you know, all the I kind of use it like the, the the gears of an engine analogy, right? All the gears have to be 
connected for the engine to turn, right? You know, you have to have the nutrition, the lifestyle, the fitness, the supplementation, and then sometimes hormones and uh, missing nutrients and things like that. So um, they all have to fit. And you're, and I love also what you said about the immune system. I think we're discovering more and more every day how extensively involved the immune system is. That whole the whole realm of immunometabolism is a whole new kind of area of research. You know, kind of like the gut microbiome. It's 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 relatively new. We're learning more and more every day of what we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah exactly yeah very very true and the gut microbiome actually plays a very important role with uh, with these polyamines because it's actually a little pharmacy that is capable of manufacturing polyamines when our tissues are no longer capable of doing this as we get older so we can get it from food we can get it from tissue production we can get it from the gut microbiota but as we get older we need to shift from those three to just the microbiome and food, mostly plants. Yeah. So, and in, in speaking of that, why don't we just for those people who have not, you know, not heard me or you talk about this before, like, um, I, I guess, um, even just basic, you know, what, you know, what the heck are polyamines? Where do they come from? And then we could talk a little bit about, um, you know, how they work, what they do. Sure. Well, um, polyamines have a hint in their name. So poly meaning many and amines are just amino acids. So they're made from, if we think about amino acids, it's like collagen powder, right? So yeah. collagen has, it's made up of amino acids. So we, we all are used to taking them to the guys who lift. Of course, they're used to taking branch chain amino acids or creatine, right? Um, polyamines are made from uh, L-ornithine and arginine, as well as S-adenosylmethionine. And uh, that's SAM-E, which is important for mood. So uh, L-arginine, people may know because that's really important for cardiovascular health. Um, older men may know a little bit more about it because it is necessary for proper erections. Mm -hmm. yes. um, but these are these are important. So we've got the mood component, we've got the cardiovascular component, you put them together, you get these polyamines. And um, so there, there's nothing, nothing super fancy about them. They are so key to all human life, um, to all life rather in humans, as well as in plants that they are in plentiful quantities in those things that have to do with reproduction. So if we look at plants, you have high spermine and spermine and putrescine content in almost all plants um, in their endosperm. And in humans, of course, the word spermine, spermidine, these have the, the keyword sperm in it. It is, of course, found in sperm where it is what DNA is wrapped around. So normally DNA gets wrapped around something called a histone bond, and that's really big. And if you think about the sperm is very tiny, it needs to move quickly and swiftly. It can't be lugging this gigantic suitcase. It needs a tiny backpack or pocketbook, but it has to take the DNA with it. And so it wraps itself around the spermidine. Uh, and the spermidine itself acts as an anti-inflammatory when sperm is manufactured, because it turns out that making sperm is a very high reactive oxygen species event. So, um, so it's found in high quantities in sperm and it's found in very high quantities in human breast milk. So when a mother is feeding her baby, she is giving lots of fructooligosaccharides, which are a fiber that the baby cannot digest. That just goes straight to the gut biome where it feeds all those nice bacteria that love to make spermidine and spermine. And it has high quantities of spermidine and spermine as well. And especially in colostrum, that first milk that the baby gets, you'll have high quantities of this as well. And it's there to seal up the lining of the gut because the neonate um, the neonates gut lining, you know, it's never had anything in it. So it needs to be tightened up and, uh, and sealed properly so it can take food. And at the same time, the immune cells that line the gut need to be activated so that it can properly identify foreign matter again, but have an appropriate immune response. So it doesn't see a walnut and say, oh, 
this is an allergen, have an allergic reaction, which of course is something that we as parents, we've seen so many allergies uh, among young people. And I have to wonder if it is uh, to do with either lack of breastfeeding um, or if it's to do with too many antibiotics, uh, somehow destroying that, um, you know, that nascent um, production of spermidine and spermine, which is so important for activating the, the early immune system in the gut. That's it. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it makes me thinking about with, because I have, and you've probably seen this too, I mean, I have so many patients that and clients that have you know, gut issues, we're seeing more and more gut issues nowadays. And obviously it has a lot to do with what you mentioned, the toxic world we live in, right? All the plastics and the additives and the, just the chemicals and glyphosate and everything else and these leaky gut junctions. And of course there's way, many, many ways to address gut issues and many, many tools to use, but this is just yet another tool um, that I, you know, I, uh, that refreshes my memory on it in terms of the healing. And I'm just, I'm curious, I'm, I don't know if you've had many clients who've reached out to you just specifically for gut issues related to spermidine or not, but I'm sure it's just, a, it, to me, it's just another tool to use, not just for everything else we're going to talk about, but specifically for gut issues. It is good for gut issues. So what I'll say is that those individuals who have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, aka SIBO, they can find, they can sometimes have trouble with um, with primidine original, which has the fructooligosaccharide. So it's got that fiber component. And I, I've noticed that people who, who have SIBO, they experience a lot of wind um, or flatulence when they have fiber, they just yep. can't digest this. So if they, you know, just have salad or whatever, it's too much for them. Um, so for those individuals, I'd say look for a product that doesn't have then that prebiotic fiber in it. And that would be something like, um, you know, primidine GF, which doesn't have that, uh, then you, you know, you still get the benefit of the spermidine, but you don't have the, the, you know, the fiber problem that you would with, uh, with the other formulation with the fructo oligosaccharide in it. Right. Right. Why don't we, and that's awesome. So why don't we, so let's talk a little bit more about some of the other hallmarks of aging and how, uh, spermidine, and, and then we can talk about spermine too, a little bit, how, how it benefits some of those hallmarks of the, the autophagy component and the immune system component, especially I think immune system of course is key on everybody's minds in the last couple of years. So I think this would be a good topic. Sure. Well, um, you know, we'll just segue straight from, uh, you know, from gut issues straight into one of the newest hallmarks of aging. So for those people who don't know what the hallmarks of aging are, um, they come from a paper that was published about 10 years ago um, by a researcher named Lopez Otin. And in that initial paper, he said there were nine hallmarks. And then just this January, he expanded them to include an additional three, one of which is gut dysbiosis. <laughs> so that that you know, that component around the gut and microbiome is now recognized as so key. And when I was first diagnosed with SIBO in 2000 and 2004, I remember going to so it was 2006, I came to London and I, I went to a doctor, a functional medicine doctor who said, oh, you've got SIBO as well. And I went to my NHS doctor and said, I've got this overgrowth. It's, you know, candida. And, uh, and the doctor said, there is no such thing as, you know, SIBO. But now it is just within 10 years, we've had this wonderful shift. Everyone recognizes the importance of a you know, of a properly functioning gut, which means, as you mentioned, that the lining is very tight. So the lining of the gut, which renews itself every 72 hours, is just one cell thick. Mm -hmm. And it's very important if you think about just one cell, that's like a, like a, a Ziploc bag <laughs> between our, all the food, everything, the alcohol, everything we put into our mouth and the rest of the you know, the bloodstream essentially. And we don't want that to, to leak at all. And fortunately it's a bit like, um, oh, I don't know. In, in the South of France, they have these bags that, uh, these shopping bags that are very, um, they're very tight uh, when you get them. And then as you sort of put things in, they open and expand yeah. and you see these yeah. big holes in them. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. think of leaky gut as the bag with all the holes in it. And you want to kind of shrink it back so that 
it's very, those junctions um, are very tight. And spermidine actually, as I mentioned, can actually tighten those junctions up, which is so important. Um, and again, of course, we know how key this is for the immune system as well, because nobody thinks that there's an immune system in the gut, but there has to be, because this is the first line of defense. Imagine soldiers, you know, outside the castle. Where do we have foreign invaders coming? Well, on our skin and in our mouth, right? Yep. Among Absolutely. a few other places. Okay. So naturally, the immune system is there. So that's the first um, that's the first hallmark of, of aging that I'll, that I'll look at. The other uh, two new hallmarks are dysfunctional autophagy, or that cell renewal and recycling process that I mentioned earlier. Um, the third one is inflammation. So we all have experienced inflammation, right? Um, if you injure yourself and you, you get swelling, that's the inflammation. And we know that chronic inflammation in the body, if we have say an underlying infection that hasn't been addressed, um, that is problematic for the body as well. Then there are these other hallmarks of aging, which, um, you know, were the ones that were originally listed in 2013. Those include um, things that your followers will know more about, like stem cell dysfunction, mitochondrial dysfunction. So the mitochondria, the powerhouses of the cell where we get energy, we need the mitochondria to be functioning properly. We don't want them to be asleep on the job because if they're asleep on the job, we're sluggish and sleepy too. Uh, epigenetic changes is another one. Uh, impaired protein folding. So proteins are, are really important cellular components. We don't talk so much about them, but um, if they're not folded properly, I like to think of it uh, as Marie Kondo. If anybody has ever looked at Marie Kondo, and I'm guessing your, your female uh, followers will know about Marie Kondo. She has a very special way of folding clothes so that it just looks beautiful in the drawers and you can sort of see everything and find it in seconds. And it just makes life so much easier and frictionless. Well, impaired protein folding is when your closet is a mess. Everything is thrown in and nothing is folded properly. So that's the, the best way to, to think of it there. Um, another one is impaired uh, Inter intercellular communication. So your cells need to properly communicate between each other. And uh, in order for that to happen, you uh, you need to also have, you know, spermidine as well. Um, telomeres, so the end caps of our chromosomes. Um, these are, you know, we have people liken this to, uh, to, to having an original. So say you have a Vermeer painting and you put it on a photocopier, which I don't suggest you do, but let's say you did it. Um, the first time you did it, it would look all right. But then if you use that copy and made a copy of it, mm -hmm. over time, you would find that the copies just were not as, they certainly weren't as vibrant or as beautiful as that original Vermeer painting. So um, your telomeres are the end caps of your chromosomes and they basically tell you how many times the cell can replicate without malfunctioning. Now, interestingly, you can actually uh, increase the length of telomeres so that you can, you can sort of rejuvenate that photocopying process. Um, even if yours are short, you can lengthen them, which is fascinating. There are some interesting ways to do it, which include everything from meditation, um, for instance, or uh, when women breastfeed their babies, they have noticed that telomeres grow longer for both the mother and the baby. Interesting. Babies that have not been breastfed have shorter telomeres. It's fascinating, right? Yeah, so, um, but at the same time, uh, spermidine will also lengthen those telomeres too. Now there are three uh, hallmarks, three additional hall hallmarks, which spermidine does not actually impact. Those would be DNA protection and repair, altered nutrient sensing, and uh, cell senescence. Um, so cell senescence is when a cell becomes like a zombie. Um, and 
when you cannot replicate it anymore, the body says, okay, no more of you. We're just, you know, let's think of the zombie cell as a bit of a, this senescent cell is a bit of a drunk. And you just say, go sit over there in the corner and just be quiet and don't disrupt the rest of us here. So you put them in the corner, but unfortunately, if you have a drunk in the corner and there's something else happening, if they don't really properly fall asleep, they might become a disturbance. And this is exactly what happens with senescent cells. They begin to disrupt whatever else is happening around them. And they begin to sort of infect the other cells nearby. This is because they are leaky. Their membranes are not, uh, the membrane loses integrity. They begin to leak some of these faulty proteins and messed up mitochondria and other dysfunctional um, cellular um, uh, content such as organelles, and this becomes problematic for the other cells around them. So those are, those are all the hallmarks, the 12 hallmarks. The first nine are the ones that spermidine uh, has been shown to positively inhibit. And uh, that's why I got extremely excited about it. The, the final three are the ones that we, we don't know mm -hmm. if, uh, if it would do this. Um, we do know, and this is the work that's been done here at the University of Oxford, that spermidine does actually inhibit immune cell senescence specifically. Mm. Nice. And there have been some really interesting papers uh, that have come out on the importance of this to human health. Uh, one was done by a professor at the University of Kyoto named Hanjo. He won the 2018 Nobel Prize for uh, discovering a protein that's involved in cancer. And uh, he shared that with a University of Texas researcher. But basically what he said about spermidine is that it appears that it would be important to rejuvenating the immune cell. So again, this surveillance, so you can properly identify cancer, that is its role. So there's some really exciting stuff coming out. And um, yeah, I don't know how much I can talk about here. I don't know if we get <laughs> censored or anything, but it's it's really it's really quite exciting. That is very cool. I love learning about new applications for for different things and um, learning yeah. new stuff. And I love the uh, the drunk. I'm going to start because I've talked about senescence and inflammation ad nauseum on my my videos and stuff. But uh, everybody's heard the zombie, but I love the drunk. I'm going to start calling them drunken zombies. I love that analogy. So that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, when you just them. keep quiet. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but we we can all relate because we've all we've all seen you know friends or family who've had a yeah. little too much. You just yeah, want to perk them, perk them someplace <laughs> where they're safe without right. them disrupting what else is going on. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So let's talk about uh, the spermidine and then the spermine too. In terms of, I guess, obviously, you know, we all know that it, it comes in foods. Are there certain foods that that provide? I know there, are, you know, I, I know there are, but maybe you could talk a little bit about how much. And maybe someone just wants to try to optimize with food. And if not, you know, how I'm sure that can benefit. But of course, we're gonna really bump it up with uh, taking spermidine, and then we can talk about uh, your product a little bit and what's in it and how it works. Sure. So food is really important. And, um, you know, I think that this movement that we're beginning to see really grow where, um, you know, let food be thy medicine, this sort of Hippocratic philosophy. I love that yeah. because if you think about it, medicine, yeah. What do you do? One of the biggest problems as a healthcare practitioner is getting your patients to be compliant and put that into their mouth. But what do patients do all day long without us telling them to do anything? Well, they're feeding themselves and this has a big impact. And, you know, every time we put something in our mouths, we're microdosing ourselves with something. So I happen to be microdosing right now with some coffee, some medium chain triglycerides, um, I've got uh, some husha wo in here, which is a Chinese herb. I've got some raw cacao um, and some collagen in here. So I am microdosing with these things. This is not just a drink. Oh, that's awesome. But if if I were drinking, say, a fizzy, you know, fizzy pop, mm -hmm. well, 
that is microdosing, but with something which is not good for us. And we've all seen, um, you know, the studies on aspartame. The BBC actually just did a big sort of expose on how uh, how aspartame appears to be a, car a, a you know carcinog a, a carcinogen, and how this is something that the World Health Organization has even said. And and yet we have millions of people still microdosing with this. So if we could just get people to microdose with the right things, spermidine and spermine being some of those molecules, we as a, you know, as a society would just be so much healthier. And we as older individuals, I, you know, I'll be 58 in a few days, would just have more mobility, greater health, more vitality, right? And more enjoyment from life and ability to contribute. So where do we find it in food? It's in high quantities in fermented foods. So it's no uh, no surprise that all the you know, immigrants to the United States, the, the German Americans brought their sauerkraut, the Korean Americans brought their kimchi, um, you know, the Bulgarians brought their kefir, uh, the Greeks had their yogurt. So you know, there are a lot of traditions where fermented foods are eaten, not just as a food preservation method, but actually for health giving benefit. Right. And now we know that not only are there billions of colony forming units in those, um, you know, in those fermented foods, but in addition, there's fiber. And there are high quantities of spermidine in there too. So you would want to try to get some kind of fermented food in your body. Now, if you've got, uh, if you've got a, a problem with histamine, say you have a lot of allergies, you might find that the histamine load in some of these fermented foods is too much for you and you can't actually take that. So then what do you do? Well, you just have a lot of plant material. All plant material has it. Mushrooms are very high in it. Legumes, uh, peas are very high in it. The Scots love their mushy peas with their salmon. That would be a really healthy dish. Right. Um, and so, you know, um, start with those. Uh, of course, wheat germ actually uh, being part of the endosperm of wheat has a high amount of it. Rice bran has a lot in it. Um, if you're going to try to get it from wheat germ, you have to make sure that you get it very, very fresh because it has such a high oil content that it goes rancid very quickly. Yep. which is why bakers ask the millers to get rid of it when they're making flour, because they don't want their bread loaves to go rancid on the shelves. So uh, make sure that it's properly, um, you know, it's refrigerated from start to finish. From the time it comes from the miller, it goes to the shop. It needs to stay refrigerated so it doesn't go rancid. And in that case, it would be, you know, a good option. Um, and, uh, you know, going to things like uh, other things that unfortunately do have histamine in them. Cheese is a good source. I know everybody's been told don't have cheese because it's not good for your cholesterol level. Um, well, dare I say, I don't believe in the cholesterol myth, <laughs> but, um, but um, because we need cholesterol for hormones, but uh, cheese has high amounts too. So hard cheeses, very, very mature cheeses, cheddar. Um, so shout out to the cheddar cheese makers in the Cheddar Valley here in England. And uh, Parmesan, good choices. So you could make, um, you know, Parmesan, a, a risotto with uh, shiitake mushrooms, which are especially high in spermidine and have some Parmesan on top. So you'd get it that way. That's a good dish. So those are those are some examples. But in the longest lived uh, communities in the world, uh, and the one which has the longest lived women in the world, Okinawa, mm -hmm. they actually have a long fermented soybean dish called natto, mm -hmm. which smells terribly. It, it doesn't taste especially pleasant. <laughs> but it is really high in spermidine, spermine, and putrescine. And it is very good for you. Um, putrescine, by the way, gets its name. If you think of the root, putrid, like putrid, yes, it actually is. Um, it is the word that uh, it shares the same root as putrid. It's smelly. Right, right. But 
there's there's there there's a good side to it too <laughs> <laughs> yeah nat i love i do like my fermented foods i love sauerkraut i love kimchi um uh but I've never, I don't think I've ever tried natto, honestly. I'll something I, I'll try anything once. I might have to look into that. <laughs> yeah. So you can get it from uh, if you go to the um go to an Asian supermarket mm-hmm. in a sort of larger metro area in the frozen food section, you might find it. Now, the only problem there is that it's it doesn't have as much of the, you know, of the, it's just the the fact that it, it's not fermented long enough. Its fermentation is sort of arrested for the frozen bit, but um, there'll be something in there for sure. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, that's very helpful because I know a lot of people. Obviously, like you said, food is medicine, right? But um, yeah, I, you know, depend. Obviously, people can look up the dosages. But and for example, um, is there like a quote unquote optimal dose for spermidine? If so, what's how much is in primidine, and then how does that compare to some of the foods, for example? Sure. Well, so um, first of all, with food, it it really varies the amount of um, it's just like the amount of vitamin C or say let's vitamin A in a right. carrot. It's going to vary from one carrot to the next. It's going to vary based on weight. It's going to vary based on how much sunshine it was exposed to, what the soil was like. So if we were to do a nutrient analysis of two carrots, they might look exactly alike, but they might have wildly differing amounts of those nutrients. Right. And so it really is difficult to, you know, to sort of compare and say, oh, well, you know, mushrooms will give you this much. Um, in terms of the minimum effective dose that we've seen in human clinical trials that have had an impact, that would be one milligram of spermidine that uh, has been shown to improve uh cognition and memory in those with subjective cognitive decline. And that was over a 90 day period. And I'll just hasten to add that that study was done with a wheat germ derived uh, spermidine product that also had spermine and putrescine in it. And I'll, you know, I'll speak more about why you want all three but um, that was the result of that particular study. Now, there are studies that are happening right now with higher doses. Um, What I always say is when we look at the body's ability to make it, we have to think about, you know, it would be foolish of us to not think about that little pharmacy, the microbiota pharmacy that's in there. And that's why you can also, if you can feed the strains of bacteria that manufacture it naturally with these fructooligosaccharides, you should also be able to bring some of that production online. It's going to vary from person to person. Whether or not you will get that one milligram amount, I can't, you know, I can't say without some kind of analysis, but um, one milligram is really what we know in terms of human efficacy. And in terms of safety, uh, the US FDA has not ruled on how much you you can, you know, what the maximum amount is. But uh, in Europe, the European Food Safety Authority, uh, EFSA, has ruled that in food derived, with food derived spermidine, you can have up to six milligrams per day safely. So there will be no negative effects. So in mouse studies, the amounts are are larger, but they're using synthetic spermidine. And whether or not, because it's synthetic, you have to use higher doses in order to get an effect, um, we don't know. Um, but of course, mouse studies are not human studies. And I always try to remind people, and you as a doctor will know that these, these animal studies look very exciting, but until they're done in humans, we can't definitively say that it's going to work this way in humans. Um, and so with safety, I'm always, uh, you know, I, from the standpoint of having an abundance of caution, I, I always say thalidomide, this anti-nausea drug that was given to pregnant women in the 50s and 60s and led to babies without limbs, mm-hmm. um, you know, that was very safe in, in rodent models. Mm-hmm. And it was then given to mothers in Europe. 
um, who were experiencing nausea to just absolutely tragic effect. And the US FDA actually did keep it off of the market um, thanks to the efforts of one female researcher. So it's, you know, we, we do have to be careful. We don't know um, what the effects of say synthetic spermidine would be on humans, um, but with food derived, it's safe up to six milligrams of supplemental spermidine. Okay. And then you can get it from your food and it, you know, it's not going to be, it shouldn't be a problem there. Right. 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 Speaking of that, I mean, I, I understand it's very, it's extremely safe. Um, have you, have there been any side effects from your clients that you've heard of from it? I, I'm, I'm not aware of any. So in terms of side effects, so um, we, like I said, we have two versions. Versions. With the um, with the gluten free version, I'd say the biggest side effect is for people who um, who take it and don't take it with enough water, and they f they don't take it with enough water, and they probably need to take it with a little bit of food, and they sort of feel a bit nauseous or like their stomach is cramping because chlorella, as you know, is a detoxifier. So it's going to act as a sponge. When it goes into the gut, it just it sort of soaks everything up and expands. And so it's that that um, that sponge-like effect that can give a bit of a side effect to some people if they don't have enough water and don't have maybe a little bit of food with it. Um, with the original, I'd say the issue is more for people who who experience some wind. And I would say, I think there's probably some underlying SIBO there that yeah. they need to take care of first. And unfortunately, you know, if it's something like candida, you know, um, you know, you know pretty well, those, some of those candida and H. pylori, those infections can be really, you know, really difficult to shift. And I don't love antibiotics, but sometimes, you know, you, you might need to use um, an antibiotic just to, just to get rid of them. And then repopulate with some of the beneficial flora right. uh, to get, you know, to restore balance because they've just sort of overrun, you know, the city uh, in your, in your gut biome. Yeah, for sure. So can you talk a little bit about primidine in terms of, you mentioned, because I definitely want to talk about the, the, the product, like the details in terms of, as you mentioned, it's not just the spermidine, but there's also some benefits from the putrezine and the spermidine as well. So maybe you can touch on that real quick. So, um, so spermidine, spermine, and putrescine often co they come in nature together. Not always. So, for example, with our gluten free product, there's no spermine in there. But putrescine is a it's known as a precursor to both. The way that say pregnenolone or DHEA would be precursors to say the the, the sex hormones, and but you may need enzymes to convert. So actually not may, you do need enzymes to convert. So where do those enzymes that allow you to convert exist? Well, they're actually in the gut biome. And it turns out that um, studies show that the, the broad spectrum antibiotics that many of us have been exposed to at one point or another in our life, <clears throat> they wipe out these bacteria that manufacture the enzyme that converts into say spermine and so one of the one of the results of this now again this is in um in mouse models we can see that without the ability without that enzyme to convert <clears throat> um putrescine or spermidine back into spermine then things like bone remodeling in mice and sort of older female mice who've gone through menopause and have osteoporosis, they cannot remodel the bone properly. And in, uh, in male mice, the issue is testicular health and fertility. And without the spermine, these mice are, these male mice are not, uh, are not as fertile as they really should be. So, you know, we have, we're always, we alter things in nature um, for a reason. Obviously, antibiotics have an important role to play and have revolutionized human health. But, um, but there is a side effect. And that side effect is um, 
either wiping out, well, both wiping out some of the beneficial bacteria we need that make these metabolites and enzymes that are needed to create things like spermine, or we eat processed foods and we feed the bad bacteria that, you know, like H. pylori, like candida, that, um, <clears throat> that not only overrun these populations, you know, they outcompete all the other bacteria in the gut to the point that the others can no longer exist because they're not getting food, right? Um, but there's a, a consequence of then those, uh, those bacterial populations doing things like lowering stomach acid such that we can't digest our food. We don't get the nutrients, even if we're taking them as supplements. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, you don't, you, you want to keep your, your gut uh, biome in balance. Um, so sometimes we do need to take the antibiotics, but we must always be mindful to eat as healthily as possible afterwards and repopulate with good strains of bacteria that can, um, you know, we need to replace what we're, what we're taking away. Right. For sure. Yeah. Very important point. And, and yes, as we talked about at the beginning, the gut microbiome, it's very tricky and it takes a lot of work. And, you know, a lot of people just tend to forget about that when they're doing all these other strategies, like the gut is yeah. primal, primal importance, you know? So, um, yeah, it's really important. And then there are these great pathways, like um, th those three polyamines are part of a recycling uh, pathway and a salvage pathway, if you will. So, um, you know, it's like um, your grandmother, when she was making her, you know, her quilt or something, if she was sewing a dress for, for somebody else, she might take, you know, a square, a scrap from there and she would use it for her quilt, right? So everything is beautifully recycled and that's how it is in the body. There are all these wonderful recycling pathways and the spermidine, spermine and putrescine one really works best when you've got all three together. And, um, and if you, you know, if you, if you're taking just say one of those things, you, you have to hope that you've got all the enzymes you need to make these others. Because if you don't, if you're missing the spermine, then that is, you know, that's potentially problematic for the body. Right. In terms of <clears throat> taking uh, supplemental spermidine, do you, is there any benefit of taking it during the day or in the evening or both? And, and number two is, does it matter if you're, if it's a workout day or a non-workout day? I'm assuming no, but and what are those two? Well, technically you could take them anytime you want it, just like you could take food, right? Anytime. But there are, there are times where, you know, we as a team and our clients have said, you know, have reported better results. So if we just look at sleep, which is one of those things like movement, and, and good nutrition that's foundational to human health. Um, we know that uh, that spermidine actually will influence the, the clock genes, which impact, they modulate circadian rhythm. So basically it looks like they help entrain the body. They make us potentially more sensitive to light and dark. And so if you take, uh, if you take, either of our products right before bed. And you do have to experiment to make sure you're okay with it before you do this, because you don't want to be up at night if for some reason, you know, it gives you energy. Um, clients report to us that their, their uh, sleep scores on their aura rings are phenomenal, in particular deep sleep, but REM sleep is also positively impacted. And so if you've got a wearable tracking device, um, you can see this generally, even the first night that you take it, you can see that bump up in deep sleep, which is, which is really exciting. And it does seem to just help you go through the night without waking up as often. So, so many people as they get older are waking up not once, but two, even three times in the night. And it's so disruptive, right? You just wake up feeling tired, right? Okay. So Definitely. yeah. So, so you, you know, you know what it's like. Um, so, so that's one thing. And I think that um, we always say, if you take it right before you sleep, which is when you're not eating and you are essentially fasting, you're kind of kickstarting the process of autophagy that you would experience when you're in sleep anyway. 
And then if you take, say, primatine GF in the morning, and a lot of people like taking that in the morning because it gives them energy, um, that is like the other bookend, right? And so you are extending the benefits of autophagy, even though you might have a breakfast, mm -hmm. you might have food because spermidine is actually a fasting mimetic. It is something for those people like me, I'm a hypothyroid patient. If I try to fast, my body says, famine, let's just put on weight. Uh, let's feel sluggish and groggy. Right. And I would, you know, if I fast, I'd have to really up my, um, you know, my armor thyroid. So, so I don't do that. I, I actually just do the do the spermidine myself as a way to get the benefits of fasting. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm going to start winding, wrapping up, be uh, cognizant of your time and uh, my time limitations. Um, is there, this has been awesome. We could probably talk for another hour. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there any, any burning knowledge you want to share or anything else new that you want to just, just mention real quick before I ask you the non-medical questions <laughs> I always wrap up my show with? <laughs> um, yeah, let me just think. I, I think uh, for me, this idea of autophagy the body's natural ability to recycle and renew its cells. That's just, it's just mind blowing for me. And if we, yes. if we can just tap into that and make sure it works properly, then we can age so much more slowly and possibly even maybe even reverse our age. I mean, I feel like I did it, you know, when I was 39, I was diagnosed with these diseases that were supposed to limit my life for five years. Right. And I have outlived my initial diagnosis by 18 years. I've outlived my supposed, you know, death date by 13. And I feel much better than I did when I was 39 at age 58. So it's, I think uh, autophagy is something, remember that we get older because of dysfunctional autophagy. But if we can keep that autophagy working properly, we can slow that aging process. Yeah, well said. I agree 100% about the whole autophagy component. And as you mentioned, there's a lot of things with food and supplementation and different things. Of course, fasting has been around forever. That's something I'm like you. I I don't do it nearly as much as I should. I mean, I've done it periodically, but um, I like to eat. So I try and I, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> but I need to. Probably... Pleasure is important. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, that's excellent. That's excellent. It, I'm sure there's going to be some ongoing, I'm sure tons of more research in that area. And especially with not only just with the product that, and spermidine, but just in autophagy in general, I'm seeing, you know, there's new stuff every day, it seems like. So, you know, how do you enhance it? How do you make it better? And uh, I agree with you. I think it's absolutely fascinating how um, the body can take care of itself and renew itself. And I don't think we've, I think we just kind of scratched the surface on that in terms of what we can do, you know, on our own and with some help, you know, so it's pretty, pretty fascinating stuff. Absolutely. So is there anything, what's up, what's up uh, for the next uh, six, 12 months for Oxford Health, for yourself, any, any, uh, anything uh, interesting coming up, any new conferences, uh, new, new presentations, yes. anything going on? Uh, well, we are, we are sponsoring the Smart Aging Summit at uh, Keeble College at the University of Oxford on okay. Saturday, the 8th of July, if anybody wants to come and we have uh, longevity uh, experts from uh, from around the UK who will be presenting, and it'll be held in Keeble College, and we'll have lunch in the Gothic Victorian Gothic dining hall, very Harry Potter. Yeah. Um, but we'll be looking at everything from hormones and uh, these new weight loss drugs like Ozempic, and. Uh, talking to the director of aging research at King's College, Dr. Richard Sue, about his latest research and how that impacts mental health. King's is doing some very cool stuff in the mental health field. Um, and, uh, you know, looking at celebrity A-list protocols and how you can how you can integrate those into your into your own life. We'll be getting that straight from some celebrity longevity doctors. So that's happening in July. Um, and then in August, we're presenting at the Japan Autophagy Consortium in Tokyo. Awesome. And we're the only foreign member of the Japan Autophagy Consortium. So the only non-Japanese member. Okay. But um, 
Oxford University Professor of Physiology, Dennis Noble, will be presenting there, and the Nobel Prize winner um, in medicine or physiology, uh, Yoshinori Osumi, who won the prize for his discovery of how autophagy works, he'll be presenting then too. So that's that's really exciting. Yeah, yeah. that's exciting. That's really cool. Very cool. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Awesome. Well, and then my last question I always ask everybody, what are you, I don't know if you, if you read or do audiobooks, but anything non-medical that you're uh, the reading uh, right now? Yeah, I was just listening to uh, Stephen Pressfield's The Artist Way. And um, yeah, that, that was, that was, uh, it's very short and a lot of it I knew already, and I think I do quite a lot of it myself, but it's for anyone who wants to start something and just feels something's holding them back. Right. And uh, the essential message is just keep showing up, yeah. keep showing up authentically and do the work and it's, you know, it will happen. So. Awesome. Very cool. I read, yeah, I, I, uh, I read one of his other books, shorter books. Of course, I'm total brain fart right now uh, on it, but I, I did enjoy it. It was, it was a quick read, but it was uh, very, yeah, very timely. It was very good. So yeah, he's very good. And years ago, I read his book, uh, you know, Bagger Vance, The Legend of Bagger Vance, oh, which yeah. was about golf. And that was so right. nice. That was such <laughs> a great book. <laughs> and I was just like, how did that guy write this book? But, right. but different. yeah, they're, they're both, they're both excellent. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Awesome. Well, uh, Leslie, thank you so much for being on the show. Maybe we'll get you back on sometime. Maybe after that conference, we could talk about some new stuff with aging. Yeah, absolutely. I'd really enjoy that. Thank you again. Cool. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Absolutely.